So here we are, um, celebrating uh, the memory of Brown Robson. And it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces uh, here to celebrate that memory uh, together. Good, okay. Uh, and people who worked in the Cup Centre, particularly Cecilia Wong, um, which for 30 years was the main vehicle for Brian's um, academic career. Uh, it was an academic career based on the application of geography. Um, and uh, he always saw application to policy as, 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 as two sides of a single coin, um, the, the, the science of geography and its application to to decision making, um, and CUPS was the was the was the mechanism through which he did that. Now, uh, this is going to be the topic of the main lecture this afternoon by Ron Martin. So I'm not going to pursue uh, Brian's main career. I want to just say a few words about Brian the man, um, uh, and where better to begin than with his eyes, that penetrating stare. Um, penetrating, it could be quite intimidating. Uh, it was a no-nonsense eye. And it reminded you that as a schoolboy, um, he, he'd been a boxer, and those were the eyes of a boxer. Uh, as he grew older, they got more and more hooded. So his, his, his gaze turned quizzical, um, inscrutable. Um, he'd look out, he'd peer at you from beneath heavy eyelids. Um, his face grew what you could call crinkly, and I think it matched the, um, the voice, which is beautifully described by um, Noel Castry in his Guardian obituary as a delightfully mellifluous sound. Uh, no, as you know, this obituary is really worth reading if you haven't seen it. He puts it so well. Brian was uh, a, a wise, kind, and straightforward man. I mean, I remember his kindness to me when I first came to Manchester. He took me up to that ghastly um, restaurant, the, the staff canteen up in the tower, which has now vanished. And um, he described how Manchester worked. It was a very good introduction. It was very kind of him to talk about the theatres, about the power structure, Graham Stringer, Howard Bernstein, about the importance of the airport, about Manchester Evening News, about Granada Television, and about everything that makes Manchester tick. Um, so, uh, including looking out from the window, the, the um, the redevelopment of Hume, which we could just glimpse, and in which he was very much involved. That was very much a, a, an example of his direct involvement, first-hand involvement in policy in the city over so many years. But uh, if we're talking about the man, let's start with the boy. Um, he was born in 1939 in South Shields, where his father worked as an electrical engineer. His mother was a primary school teacher. Um, and they later retired to Wooler in Northumberland. He's one of three children. Uh, and by the way, in my opening remarks, I should have mentioned Peter, his stepson, who is sitting here in front, who's also with us in person and his, and his wife. Um, so, uh, but not present is his younger sister, Mary, who writes, our grandparents had their roots in Western North Northumberland, so we enjoyed a rural upbringing of hill and moor walking, camping and exploring the sources of rivers. There was always at least one dog involved. Our father made sure that we could read an OS map accurately from a young age. It was also a primitive stone cottage between Ford and Etal for weekends and holidays lit by tilly lamps and served by a splendid well in the surrounding land. Now, between Ford and Etal, I had to get out my one-inch map to see where that was. And here we've got Etal with its uh, castle and its manor and its moor. 
and you've got Ford with its two castles and its forge uh, and, and, and its moss. And what a fantastic place to grow up. What a fantastic setting for the boyhood of this future geographer. Um, and it's so easy to see how this setting nurtured two of Brian's lifelong passions. One was for the uplands, for the North Country. Um, here he is on a, on a limestone pavement. Here he is possibly going for Rothenstall. I'm not quite sure where the location is, perhaps Peter knows. Um, uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a paved road, such as you have about Rothenstall. I'm the experts, you know, my mother. Yeah, yeah, well, maybe she's, she's, she's here uh, so in attendance, so maybe she can, she can fill us in on the chat. Um, but uh, so, so th the setting of his childhood, uh, Tilly lamp lit uh, at times in the stone cottage between Ford and Etta. Partly, I, I see that as, as, as what confirmed him as a northerner, but partly also it confirmed his love of maps. Equipped with OS maps, they roamed the worlds. And maps were always a constant feature of Brian's life. Um, and here, a photograph taken five years after his marriage to, to Glenna. Uh, it's not the conquistador beard that I want to draw attention to, nor is it his, his lovely wife, but the maps on the wall behind him. And similarly, uh, in this famous photograph taken in Didsbury, the, the, the map of the channel on the wall behind him, and the fact that he's reading the National Maritime Museum collection catalogue of, uh, of sea charts. Or if we go to his office in the School of Geography, the fact that he had this fantastic map of Rome on the wall behind him, uh, or equally when he was working at home in Didsbury, uh, the map that hung behind his desk. Um, so maps were always a passion, historic maps. And uh, when he retired, this is a very strange thing, he could pursue that passion. And uh, you know, all of us who've, who've retired have to decide, you know, do we want to keep our hand in an academic work? And um, Brian did so much so. And he did it by specialising and producing some really weighty and significant and original research on the history of cartography, on the history of maps particularly urban maps. This fed his interest in urban mapping, which now retired, he has been able to pursue from his bio in the Cartographic Journal of 2014. So what I want to do is just look at four or perhaps five of his map history productions, uh, which represent this great monument to, 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 to Brian, I mean, quite apart from the work that Ron Martin is going to talk about shortly afterwards. Now, the first is, is a wonderful paper called Math, Maps and Mathematics in the Journal of Historical Geography, which is a study of the 1832 Reform Act. And this is one of the maps that accompanies that paper, done by, by Graham Bowden, the, uh, uh, one of the two wonderful cartographers who were in the School of Geography and who came when geography merged with IDPM and planning to form the seed. Um, this is a map which shows the outcome of the 1832 Reform Act, which as you know, was intended to tackle the grave problem of rotten and pocket boroughs. And here you've got in squares the distribution of retained boroughs. In the dark triangles, you've got the Schedule A, which is the list of uh, boroughs which would be abolished because they were rotten and they would in future have no MPs. In the open, and look at how they're concentrated in the West Country and in the South of England. Uh, in Schedule B, you have the boroughs which were allowed to retain one MP, a few of those in the uh, West Midlands. And then the new boroughs uh, 
which had two, one or two MPs, and those are overwhelmingly in the north of England. So this was the, this was the historic moment when the democratic deficit of, um, of the population shift, produced by the population shift, uh, to the industrial north. Yeah. But how did it occur? It was an incredibly complicated, fraught political issue, this reform of local government boundaries. It always is. And Brian showed how cunningly two cartographers were brought in to the Boundary Commission, two people from military engineering backgrounds, and how they devised, first of all, a set of maps um, in very short order, just six months, um, maps which showed the true built-up areas of, of towns as against the, the, the area which was represented in the, the official definition of the borough. So here you've got the map of Wilton, which had 40 electors, all of whom were in the pocket of the Earls of Pembroke and Pembroke House here. And in the yellow, which is for the purposes of the article, is overlaid with the dotted line, you have the, um, the larger built up area as defined as an urban area in the um, work of the cartographer Drummond uh, Dawson. Um, and uh, Dawson, yes, that's right. And secondly, you have, um, and, and he, he, he developed an exact mathematical formula to rank the boroughs which uh, still were significant in economic and demographic terms, and those which were insignificant and were merely corrupt hangovers of the uh, old order. And, and here you've got the outcome, the, the second um, map of the uh, 1832 reform, which in this case, reduce the numbers of MPs elected by these original 40 um, to, uh, to, to, from two to one, and enlarge the area from 0.8 square miles to 49.4 square miles. Um, so anyway, just to illustrate the, the, um, the, the cartographic underpinning uh, of, this, of this work. Then um, the second paper, having, having explored maps and maths, which goes back to his earliest work, 1973, Urban Analysis, a book which is familiar to generations of geographers. Um, his second two papers were, were biographical. They were looking at the lives of 19th century map makers and surveyors. And these are deeply obscure characters because very little is known about them. First was John Wood, who was an immensely prolific map maker, map maker in the early 19th century, uh, but who, uh, as, as described in the first of these papers, the undervalued cartographer. Undervalued puts it mildly. I was looking in this morning in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, the DNB. Uh, for John Woods, and there are no less than 11 John Woods who were contemporaries of this um, undervalued cartographer. Uh, one was a geographer, another was a portrait painter, the third was a clergyman, there were naval architect, shipbuilder, surgeon, worsted manufacturer, microscopologist, music publisher, baronet, civil servant, archaeologist, and sculptor. But no mention of this highly significant figure in the history of cartography, which was John Wood, the Scottish map maker, who in the course of his career produced no less than 140, 150 detailed town plans um, in the early 19th century. And this is one of them. You can see the quality of the, of the, of the, of the mapping. And this predates the work of the Ordnance Survey, um, uh, and it, what's staggering is, is that it covers the whole of the British Isles, from Stornoway uh, down to down to down to Falmouth, places in the, in the far west country. 
and it's before the railways. Even. So um, the first paper on John Wood has to do with who was this character forgotten by history? And Brown produces the answer with a lot of detective work, a lot of rummaging through uh, map collections in the archives of national libraries and universities, the length and breadth of the country. And the second paper, which is John Wood II, which was published next to it in the Cartographic Journal, it asks a very fascinating question. Uh, how did he pay for his maps? And how did he decide what, which of the 150, which of the towns of Britain he would map? Um, and uh, he explores these questions, um, bringing out the extraordinarily precarious nature of the surveyor's livelihood, particularly peripatetic surveyors, such as this Scottish gentleman who had worked in Newcastle and gradually worked his way down the country, um, competing with local surveyors for the precarious market of map production. Very, very fascinating stuff and completely original. Um, and then uh, the second exercise in cartographic biography has to do with a, a, a map maker who was active in Manchester and Salford, called Richard Thornton, um, who produced two famous large plans of Manchester and Salford, one in 1832, the other in 1851. And they are fantastic pieces of work, um, immensely detailed. But again, this character is totally unknown to history. No DNB entry, no trail. It required immense detective work to, to, to recover his memory. And that's what Brian did uh, in this work with uh, Terry White uh, of Manchester Metropolitan, the historian, um, which is published in Northern History uh, only two years ago. Um, and then that led to the two final uh, works, which uh, were books. And the first of them was uh, his um, collaboration with Martin Dodge, who's here, with Martin and with Terry White, which is uh, a, a wonderful history of maps in Manchester. Um, and he was using, obviously, his knowledge of the 19th century mapping and Martin's knowledge of the 20th century history of Manchester um, to, 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 to provide something which is a, a wonderful chronological survey of the history of this great city, um, illustrated with or illuminated by um, wonderful color reproductions of, of maps and, and images. Um, and then finally, he did the same again, the same publishers, uh, together with uh, Michael Bark, who's here, and Tony Champion, who's with us online. And this is a book which is due to be launched, well, the website says tomorrow, but Michael says that it's not tomorrow, but it's Thursday, is it? A week on Friday at the Lytton Filth. But, but you, you have uh, sample copies of them here, which you can admire. And it's the most amazingly rich and informative book about the history of Newcastle using uh, Brown's knowledge of its maps and, and Tony's familiarity with modern Newcastle and Michael's uh, long historical perspective to tell the story of the city um, and, 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 and to illustrate it in this compelling way with, um, with color, color maps. Okay, so this is a career, uh, the, the way it ends up in Newcastle um, is, 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 is amazingly neat and symmetrical. Um, it's fantastic. Um, 
and it was a career of sustained scholarly input, um, which uh, one can only uh, say leaves one in, in awe. Um, so to conclude, I think this is um, as much a celebration of a dear and distinguished colleague as it is a commemoration. And, uh, and I only wish he was here to, to, to um, participate in it. Uh, okay, thank you very much indeed.